All right, folks, we are going to go ahead and get started. We've got General Manager Tony Mizuko here. We've got a number of questions we're going to start getting through. Before we begin, I do have information on our call center that I want to encourage everyone to give the call center a call. The number is 781-352-2363. Once again, that's our call center. Okay, getting some sounds of the good. Hello, everyone. So uh, 781-352-2363 is our call center. It is open 8 to 4, Monday through Friday. In the next week, we will be adding hours. We're looking to add weekend hours and possibly some evening hours. We do have translation services available. So if English is not your first name, uh, language, you can contact the call center. If you give them your name and number and the language that you need translation in, we will be able to call you back and you'll be able to access the call center services with a translator. Beginning next week, we will have uh, some counseling services available well. Uh, so if you just need somebody to talk to, you can call the call center. And all of our staff on the call center line are available to talk if you do feel you just need to talk to somebody as we go through this pandemic. And as folks are stuck at home, we understand the toll it's taking on everyone. So by all means, call if you just need to talk to somebody. We're going to jump right into some of the questions because we do have quite a few questions and then we have some announcements. Uh, the first one I have is, it says here, why does Norwood have over a thousand cases and other towns like Brookline, which is more dense, has a third of the cases? So the answer to that is Norwood doesn't have over a thousand cases. I want to show everyone the number from the state. Our number is actually around 300 cases. I believe it's 316 as of yesterday. If you go on to the Department of Public Health's website, so that's the Massachusetts State Department of Health website, they list the case counts by town every uh, Wednesday. So that's this sheet right here. Now it's important to know that it's both the count of cases and the rate per 100,000 residents. So here we use the town of Abington as an example. They have 78 cases and their rate is 434 per 100,000 residents. Abington does not have 100,000 residents, so that's just a mathematical rate. We'll go take a look at Norwood's numbers so we can make sure everyone understands the distinction. This is Norwood as of yesterday. So as of yesterday, that's our case count right there, 316 cases. And that 1,049.41 that's our cases per 100,000 population. Now, Norwood does not have 100,000 people, so it's, again, a mathematical case. In theory, if we had 100,000 people, that's how many cases we would have. So we're currently at about 316 cases. Now, I'll review briefly, as I did last week, why some of our numbers are, uh, they appear to be on the higher end as a percentage, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, somebody mentioned here the town of Brookline, which is more dense, has a third of the cases. The two minor factors impacting our case count are density in demographics or socioeconomics. So we are dense. Uh, Norwood is more dense than its surrounding communities. And we often think of ourselves as being very similar to our surrounding communities, Westwood and Dedham and Canton. We're fundamentally denser than they are as communities. We're much closer to Brookline in terms of density. Now Brookline is more dense than Norwood. However, Brookline is a much wealthier community. And unfortunately you do see quite a bit of uh, a, a direct trend between socioeconomics or demographics and wealth level in communities. The wealthier a community, the less likely they are to have a higher infection rate. And unfortunately, part of that reason is that lower income workers tend to work in essential jobs at restaurants and uh, grocery stores and elsewhere. So that's a challenge we face. You have fewer of those folks in Brookline. There's lower income individuals all over, but Brookline is not as dense as us. They're technically more dense than us, but they're much wealthier. I actually tried to look it up today. They're about on a um, uh, per capita basis. They're uh, about 15 or 20 percent wealthier than us. Their average home price is about 50 percent higher than ours. And your higher income workers are generally able to stay home and work from home. It's not the case with your cafeteria workers, with other retail and service industry workers who are still out there. So the two minor factors in our case count are we are denser than most other communities, certainly the communities around us. And our demographics don't quite match the communities around us as well. One of the other reasons that our number is where it is, is we have 655 nursing beds in Norwood. So we have four nursing homes, two assisted living facilities. It's a total of 655 beds in town. Over 40% of the cases in Norwood are at nursing facilities, and that's unfortunate. You're seeing that in uh, many communities. If those six facilities were simply located over the line in Westward or Canton, our number would actually be below the state average by quite a bit. The nursing homes being probably the single largest factor. In addition to that, the availability of testing in Norwood has always been very good. Now, we know testing still isn't anywhere where we would want it to be for the entire Commonwealth or for the country, 
but Norwood Hospital hasn't experienced a shortage of tests and neither has urgent care. So the availability to get a test when one is recommended by uh, your doctor or a public health official does factor into how many people are tested. So we're able to, we've been able to get tests done quite frequently at Norwood Hospital and at urgent care. So we're pumping out a lot of tests. The more tests you do, the higher the numbers are going to be. So that's a positive community. We're happy that we're able to make sure people get tested. Remember, the number of cases isn't necessarily a reflection of the number of people who have contracted COVID-19. It's the number of people who have tested positive for COVID-19. If you went to any community in the Commonwealth and tested an additional thousand people, some of them would inevitably test positive and their number would appear to be higher. The last reason that we see some of the numbers we do is we've been very aggressive with our contact tracing and our public health department, which has been doing this for many, many years and they're well trained in what they do, we're getting to folks within 24 hours. There are communities that have reported sometimes a multi-day lag before they can get to folks. So we're very quick at closing the loop. We're very quick at recommending people and requiring them to get tests. And I had said last week that uh, I was, I believe the first person tested at Norwood Hospital and our public health department said, you had a slight cough. Doesn't mean, that, don't matter that you doesn't, don't have a temperature, you need to go and get tested. So I went and got tested and I ended up testing positive. So those are sort of why our numbers where are where they are. One other factor on the number for the community to remember that the boundaries of our community in Norwood are just that. They're made up boundaries that somebody drew a line on a map however many years ago. So the flow of people in and out of the community, it's really, that number is the number of people who live in the town of Norwood. Now you could, and that includes all those nursing beds. You could live in Norwood, work in Boston, contract uh, COVID-19 in Boston or any other community, come back to Norwood and you're a Norwood case. Uh, question we got from a few people, why, why masks are not mandatory in Norwood? And it really has to do with working towards a new social norm. Uh, there's a lot of things that are mandatory or illegal that we don't have a lot of compliance in. When you go to a grocery store, at least my experience going to the grocery stores here in Norwood, and I believe Big Y is making folks before they enter have a mask and they're requiring their employees to wear a mask. It's quite, uh, I'd say that the overall success rate or the overall compliance rate is quite high. Masks need to become a new social norm. So we encourage everyone to wear a mask. If we were to try to make it, and some communities have, but what they're really doing is issuing public health orders and assuming they'll hold up in court and assuming they're legal, that you have to wear a mask. We don't quite have the wide availability of masks that we'd like yet, which means everyone can't necessarily put their hands on a mask. Yes, you could wear a t-shirt, you could wear a, uh, a scarf or something over your face, but we need masks to become the social norm. Um, I had used the, uh, uh, you know, people generally wear a, a coat when you go out, or I don't know, everyone wears underwear, it's a social norm, or I assume they do. It needs to become the norm in society, and if we try to start enforcing it and we legally say you have to wear a mask and we're going to fine you if you don't, I have to have a police officer or a public health officer then interact with you. We then spend resources trying to force somebody to do something that really, if it doesn't become the social norm, we're not going to get the compliance we need. The stay-at-home advisory that the governor issued is just that. It's an advisory. Uh, the CDC mask guidance is an advisory. The State Department of Health mask guidance is an advisory. We certainly share that. We advise everyone to wear a mask when you're in contact with other individuals and when you go shopping uh, at the grocery store. But if we don't make this a social norm, it's not going to work. So it, we do have to rely on a certain amount of folks being willing to comply with what society needs as a whole. And I think the compliance has actually been great so far. I'm really surprised when I go into the grocery store how we have very quickly become a society where an overwhelming majority of people are wearing masks in a grocery store. 30 days ago, that was unheard of. And 90 days ago, if you had said you should wear a mask in a grocery store, everyone would have thought there was something uh, something wrong with you. It's just like that society has flipped over and we've begun adapting. I think that's an incredible show of resiliency in the community. And I think we need to continue doing that. The compliance with a lot of other items related to this has been fantastic in the community overall. You never have 100% compliance, compliance anywhere, but I think the mask compliance has been phenomenal so far. It's got to become that social norm. So there's that social pressure to do it. Uh, question we got is what protection, what preventions are you taking for Norwood population? When you think of COVID-19, there's sort of two sides to it. One of them is the specific virus related issues. We followed all the CDC and state guidelines in terms of making sure that businesses have been shut down, school children are out. Incidentally, the idea that school children are out of school from, we started in early March all the way through June, so three and a half months. I don't think there's a time in our history where schools have been closed for three and a half months. I don't believe we closed schools for three and a half months during the Spanish flu. I'd have to check that. 
during both world wars. We didn't close schools for three and a half months. We didn't close schools for three and a half months uh, after 9-11. So society as a whole has already undertaken unprecedented actions all to try to slow the spread of COVID-19. And we're seeing that. We're following those state and uh, federal guidelines on CDC. We're doing all of our contact tracing. That's what we're doing specifically related to COVID-19. There's a lot of after effects and other issues that we're facing as a result of COVID-19 that we're dealing with as well. We, in just a few short weeks, have set up a citizen call center where we've been able to help people find access to unemployment, to food benefits, answers to questions about town services, and some help with folks who are going through tough times and some counseling services. We set that up and they're doing it digitally in, it took us no more than two or three weeks to get up and running. We've set up a temporary uh, food pantry at the high school that's gonna run every other week. And Cindy Durain, one of the principals at the high school has been instrumental in that. Uh, Jerry Miller, former recreation director, uh, Jeff Baguma, uh, officer with the Norwood Police Department, Katie Nil Rizzo, uh, resident and volunteer. A lot of folks have done a lot for that and we're gonna continue doing that. We served 88 families last week. We had 30 families that we this week rather that we had to turn away. We're getting them aid in other ways. And we but we've been able to get that set up within two weeks and get food aid to all of those individuals. Our cafeteria staff has put together a really, I think it's first in Massachusetts, if not first in the country, meal program where we're serving family style meals once a week because food security and people having access to food is a huge, huge issue we're facing in the community. In about a two week time frame, it went from the idea was brought up at an incident command meeting to our food service team and our cafeteria workers implemented it. We served 250 meals last week and 330 meals this week. And those are family style meals for the schools. That's never been done before. That all happened within two weeks. We have ramped up operations in such a short period of time to help folks out that it's been really incredible. What the school department has done has been absolutely outstanding. The world has an education model that hasn't really changed in 100 years, and teachers were unceremoniously sort of tossed out of their classrooms and said, come up with a way to teach people online right away. And that's been incredibly difficult for them to do. And they've done wonderful with the resources they have and the confines of the law that we currently have. That's something that the school department has done. The recreation department and the library have done incredible work with all the different programs that the rec department has done. The rec department got the actual Easter bunny to come here to Norwood. I I found that fascinating. I thought it was just somebody in a mask and then I found out it was actually the Easter bunny. The library has been manning their online chat. They've expanded services to folks uh, downloading books. They've been running. So that that chat service that the library has, if you need access to library services, is open 24-7. The library has also been doing book readings online. Uh, They've done some pretty incredible stuff. A lot of our departments that are internally focused, the police and public safety, they're still having to perform their duties just as they always have. They've had to change how they operate. They've had to move to different locations and change their procedures, but they've found a way to make sure that they're still providing the same level of police, fire, and EMS service that we always have provided. Our public works department has done the same. We're still getting all of our infrastructure and road work done and our... um, our plant work done. The school facilities team, they're not taking a break. They, I was visiting some of our school buildings recently. They're making repairs to the buildings. They're cleaning them. They're painting them, doing work. I mean, they're making some incredible, uh, incredible improvements in the building. And of course, our light department is still out there keeping the electricity and the internet on for us. So when you look at the whole picture of there's the virus specific items that we have to take care of. And then there's all of the societal impacts that we're also taking care of. There's quite a lot that's been done uh, globally, in a sense, in Norwood to try to take care of residents with a particular emphasis on food security and other needs. We've launched the Norwood Fund. To date, we've received around $20,000 in donations from businesses and restaurants, uh, business, sorry, businesses and residents. Friends of Norwood Center, incidentally, have raised about $10,000 to help local businesses and feed the front lines, feeding first responders and uh, hospital workers as well. That's all happened in the matter of we're now in maybe six weeks of this. So it's been pretty incredible what's been able to be stood up in just a short period of time with certain town officials having to have been quarantined at different times, myself uh, included. So uh, I'm going to move on to a couple other questions here. Uh, This one, a very good one, education question. Will more money be provided or made available for the Norwood Public Schools to assist with the learning gaps that will be present the upcoming school year? Will class sizes be smaller? Will there be more support staff hired? So to the first question about what we're going to do to try to address the learning gap that we know we're going to have that students are out of school and online learning hasn't necessarily caught up to traditional classroom learning and the online learning becomes more difficult uh, for the younger students. At this point in time, the federal government has allocated money through the CARES Act that's going to the states to provide money for additional or alternative learning solutions. My understanding from conversations with the state and the superintendent is that about $200 million is coming to Massachusetts. 
And the idea at this point, and this could always change depending on how the strings are attached to that money, is that they'll be able to run some kind of summer programs with that. So that's hopefully going to be the goal is to close some of that gap to the extent practical by offering sort of a, some sort of additional summer learning programs. The details aren't all out yet. They're not 100% sure they'll be able to use that money towards it. But that's the idea is that you have these learning gaps. You need to come up with something new to address them and keep kids moving forward. Uh, that may continue into the fall. They may do a Saturday school or a weekend. And saying, find a way to try to make that happen with additional money coming from the federal and the state governments. That's what they're primarily focused on. But there again, it's here's money to address a problem that nobody would have ever seen that we wouldn't be in school for four months at a time. Uh, in terms of the class sizes or the support, the additional support staff, we're waiting on guidance from DESE, which is the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, on what they're saying classrooms should look like in the fall. Uh, the short answer is nobody's really sure. Are there going to be there's going to be some kind of social distancing guidelines. They may look at a model where it's a split day or there's additional online learning. Hasn't really been determined yet since we're still fairly in the early or the mid phases of the whole uh, dealing with COVID-19 and education has really been upended. Uh, and it's not just that folks weren't prepared. It's if a year ago the superintendent had stood up and said, hey, we should prepare to not have students in classrooms for five months. Everyone would have thought it was, uh, it was a little loopy and here's the situation we find ourselves in. So what I'm hoping is that as that money flows through the uh, federal and state governments to us, we'll be able to implement some supplementary programs to help close that learning gap. Uh, what actually transpires remains to be seen. Um, some, you know, some folks get worried when they hear that this is going to be with us for 10 months or 18 months or 24 months. Some element of social distancing is going to be with us probably permanently. I mean, there's going to be some changes to society that I don't think are going to go away anytime soon. And if anyone thinks of previous generations and, and how they handled uh, crises. And then there were always things that stuck with them that future generations said, oh, I can't believe that, you know, they're still doing A, B, or C. I think you'll see some of that. That's my um, my guess. I'll scroll down here on some of the uh, questions. Uh, making masks in Norwood has been uh, absolutely fantastic. I mean, when you talk about the home front, um, it's just been incredible that a bunch of folks have decided to just get their sewing machines out and making masks and those masks have made a difference. They're getting out there into the community. We're using some of those masks and we're deploying them to different areas in the community as we need them as well. We don't have an unlimited supply of masks. However, somebody commented they're looking for masks for children. Any suggestions? Call the Citizen Call Center, give them your name and number and we will be able to add you a list and as we get masks in, we'll be able to forward some to you. You can also reach out making masks in Norwood. Um, group and they'll uh, they may be able to help you out if they can't help you out directly because they're focusing on first responders and high needs call and leave us uh, your name and number talk to one of the folks at the call center and we'll be able to get you masks at some point or at least get you on a list as they come in we'll know that you need them um charlotte Canelli, the library is doing an incredible job again libraries have operated the same way for a couple of millennia and they were unceremoniously thrown out of the library and told to figure out how to do it uh, from home and remotely and they've risen to the challenge and done, done incredibly. Uh, Charlotte, Friends of Norwood Center, wow, up to $21,000. What's great about that money that they've raised is it, it's really, it's twofold. On the one hand, it's feeding the front line. It's feeding the hospital workers who are going in every day and dealing with this and nursing home workers, as well as uh, police and fire who are on the front lines. It's also money going right into local businesses. So it, it, it's very rare that you have an opportunity to raise money and have that dual impact of you're feeding the front line and you're helping local businesses that are struggling. It, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Kudos to Charlotte and the downtown group for doing that. We we had some exciting things coming planned for downtown uh, around Memorial Day. They'll probably be kicked off a uh, another year um, for uh, just because we may not be quite out of our social distancing. Uh, question, are the school nurses helping in mitigation and contact tracing? Could you please explain the process for those who've been tested positive and what's been done to notify those? Yes, our school nurses are not sitting home enjoying a day off. They have been drafted into service of the town uh, as part of our overall public health uh, program to make sure that we are doing all the contact tracing. So all of our contact tracing is done by trained public health staff or public health nurses. So the school nurses have been brought into that loop. They've done fantastic. Uh, a short, funny story on that. Somebody had told me a year or two ago, they had said, hey, have you ever thought about putting the school nurses in the public health department? And then they would all sort of report up to the, the head school nurse and then the town's public health nurse and the public health director. And I said, you know, that that's an interesting model. I've never heard of that being done anywhere. And, and you know, there wouldn't really be any a dollar savings, but maybe it would create a better, more robust public health model. And, and then I sort of put the idea aside and then COVID-19 came in and we said, Oh God, we need more nurses. Where do we have them? And the school nurses have done a great job stepping up to that place.
late. So they're getting assigned cases just as the public health staff are uh, when somebody tests positive for COVID-19. Uh, and they've done a fantastic job for that. Uh, somebody made a comment about the grocery store workers. Here again, uh, a year ago, if you said we'd have a disaster and the front line would have been grocery store workers, nobody would have thought it. And they're doing incredible. I know I go grocery shopping. I try to limit it to once a week. Um, I tend to write a list and forget half the stuff on my list, which leads me to going in twice sometimes. But they're smiling, they're working, and they're putting themselves at risk for all of us for uh, for low workers, the grocery for low wages. The grocery store workers are doing great, just like cafeteria workers. It's really incredible. Uh, the contact tracing process. So here's here's what's happened. Uh, the um, first, let's say somebody tests positive with COVID nineteen. That lab result goes to that person's doctor, and it goes to the state. The state then passes that down to us. A public health nurse will call you and say, unfortunately, you've tested positive for COVID-19. We offer wraparound services. So if you need help getting grocery deliveries while you're homebound, if you need medical assistance, we find a way to get you those services. We then begin the contact tracing process, which is really asking, where have you been the last X days? Or, you know, there's, there's different formulas based on when you tested positive. And then we begin the quarantine and isolation process for those people. So if somebody called me today and said, Tony, uh, you've tested positive. Uh, where have you been in the last couple of days? They list that out. They do sort of an intake. You, you'd call it an investigation. It's really a series of questions. And um, they then go and ask those people if they need to quarantine. When they have those conversations with folks, if they say, you were in contact with somebody who tested positive, uh, do you have any symptoms? And they say, well, gee, you know, I did see that person five days ago and I have a little bit of a runny nose or I have a cough. And the public health nurses make that decision. I don't know what, they, I don't actually make that decision. So that may not be what they make the decision on, but then they'll say, yes, you should get, get tested or no, you shouldn't go get tested. Here's how you should work with your family and here's what precautions you should take. And we offer the quarantined individuals wraparound services as well. So if somebody said, okay, I can stay home for the next 10 days, but uh, I need help getting groceries or I need help taking care of this or that, we're able to offer them wraparound services through the town's general services and the public health service to make sure that they're taken care of. So those folks don't have to leave their home. They don't have to worry about getting out to get the services they need. So that's a great question. Uh, did I donate plasma with antibodies? I've been looking for, I tested positive for COVID-19. I've been looking for legitimate means to do that. Some folks have done it. Um, I have not found a sort of central place where I can go and do that. Um, does, Norwood Urgent, does Norwood Hospital or Urgent Care have antibody testing yet? I don't believe they do. That The antibody testing is not as wide as it is. There have been some um, folks out there who have said that they specifically want them, the, the antibody testing, but it seems to be more academic at this point. I'd be more than happy to do it every time I find something that I think it's an option. I sort of run it by the public health department and they either say, yeah, contact them, or sometimes it's a company that's doing it and it just becomes a a hassle to almost do it. I don't know how valuable my antibodies would be given that it's been quite a while since I tested positive. I'm also not an epidemiologist, so I know very little about that, but I'd be more than happy to help uh, any way I can. I'll take uh, one more online question before going back to some of the ones we'd written in. Are any of the food insecurity contacts picking up and delivering from Pedro's Place for veterans? I believe it's weekly. I saw a van picking up for another town. We are in contact with that program. The veterans agent coordinates a lot of the specific options for veterans. So one of the things when people call us through the call center and ask, we always ask, is there somebody over 60 in the home? Is somebody in the home a veteran? Because that opens up different areas of service. I do know through one of the programs in Foxborough, because there's actually several going on, we were able to get fresh produce that was given out at the, uh, the temporary pantry or what we're going to be calling the Mustang Pantry shortly. Uh, oh, actually, this past week we gave it out. So that's a great question. Uh, what are the plans for municipal buildings, town hall, library, senior center, civic center to open? Another great question. I'll jump into that one before we go to some of the emailed questions. So at this point, we're waiting on guidance from the state. My assumption and what our incident command team figures is likely to happen is absent any other need for the building, the civic, which is more or less a gym, will probably open when the state relaxes guidelines on gyms and phys in uh, physical activity locations like that. The library, when retail is allowed to open, the library would certainly be allowed to open when, and it's a big when, and it's a big if, and the state may have different guidance. So if stores are allowed to go to door-to-door uh, -door delivery where you could go to uh, a retail store that's currently closed and pick something up, we may be able to expand some services at the library at that point. It probably won't be open until the uh, there's sort of a more full opening of retail. Things are generally going to open up when Massachusetts gets to that point in sort of the reverse order of where they closed. So you'll probably see construction in Boston and Cambridge re, uh, reopen up, sort of manufacturing, and it'll move out 
sort of this with schools sort of obviously being in September, being one of the last things and schools closed before a lot of other businesses and retail uh, closed as well. So it's likely to go along that path. Um, town hall is a challenging question. One of the last uh, sort of business types to open up are probably going to be areas where people don't need to be open to the public or don't need to serve uh, customers. So you think of a law firm, they can work remotely. The places that can work remotely should stay working remotely as long as possible and be the last sort of centers to open up. Now, Town Hall serves the public. We have found means to make sure all of our services are still available so we can still get building permits done. You can still get a marriage license if it's necessary. You can still pay bills. You can still get assessor's records. So we're able to make that function on a skeleton crew here and being closed to the public. So for me, I don't like the idea that town hall is not open to the public, but from a safety standpoint, if we don't need people coming in the building, if we can reduce the number of human contacts in the building and in general in the community, I'd rather have something that's a little bit more essential open to the public because if somebody wants to come in and pay a bill, they can mail that bill in or they can do it online. So I'd rather save that possible human interaction for a human service business to open up, a bar hairdresser let them uh, get it to earn some uh, some money but that's my speculation as soon as we can safely open town hall and there, there's clearance from the state and our local public health officials feel that it's okay to do, we'd love to be back open to the public uh, how long it's going to take we don't know but the, the services that don't necessarily need to open directly back up to the public you're going to want to minimize that human interaction as long as you possibly can uh, one question we got is, is the Board of Health overseeing the stores uh, that stores are complying with laws? Yes, it's primarily a health function. So if we had a retail store that was not supposed to be operating, those complaints first go through the Board of Health, who addresses them. We work with the state. We work with the business owner. Uh, there's some businesses that end up being in the... Um, you know, in a gray area and, you know, e-commerce is allowed. Well, if I own my business, can I do e-commerce? Well, your business is not allowed, but e-commerce is allowed. So we try to liaise with those businesses and the state. Uh, everything's a little different in every town. We have received some complaints occasionally from businesses in other towns that may be not operating and they think we shouldn't operate. We investigate those. We've decided at this point we're not taking complaints from businesses in other towns if they don't agree with our interpretation. We're making decisions based on what we think is right and we're following with the state guidance and if somebody else interprets it differently in another community, they've got to take that up with the state. We're, we're trying to make sure we're being consistent here in Norwood. But if you did see a business open that you didn't think was supposed to be open, uh, by all means, e uh, call the health department or email them at health at norwoodma.gov, and they'll uh, we investigate all those calls. We do get them. Uh, we've gotten calls from folks who aren't sure if they're essential or not, and we try to look and uh, see if we can come up with a ruling. Any business that's not sure if they're essential or not, they can apply to the state for a certificate that says they're essential. That's what we always recommend that they do. We've had a few businesses where we've had to issue notices. Sometimes what happens is you may have a chain business where they've got... 25 stores and one is in Norwood and then well eight towns have told them they could open and uh, you know 12 towns have told them they, they they can't open and we just try to you know follow what the best guidance that we can uh, our stores required to have hand sanitizers and wipes at the entrance at this point it's not required we strongly recommend it I believe all the grocery stores are doing it, um, it there's a certain degree of personal response for everyone going into a uh, store so if you don't feel comfortable going in, we don't want you to, certainly I wouldn't uh, go in. I carry a little bit of hand sanitizer with me. Um, I, I have spilled it into the pockets of my coat more times than I want to count. I carry my mask. I have a, two spare gloves in the car. So I try to be as safe as I can, and we need a little bit of personal responsibility from everyone, as well as I think grocery stores have stepped up to the plate, given the uh, really the immense challenge that they're facing. Their business model has sort of been upended uh, as well. And I've gone into uh, this, the grocery store I tend to go to in town, couple times. I think every time they've had the wipes available and uh, I sort of grab a wipe and wipe down my um, my cart or my basket. And I do know the last time I was in there, they had staff wiping down the baskets uh, as well. And I think the compliance of people are um, generally has actually been exceptional. You know, you know, you're supposed to go the right way in the grocery store and the lanes are one way. I keep skipping a lane because I want to go down it to go down the other one. And then there's too many people in there. And then I go down the other one and I get a little lost in the grocery store. But I think I finally figured out my, uh, my path. Uh, question, have you seen any ways to deliver services that you can carry forward after the pandemic to make services from the town easier in the future? So a couple of things, we're we're going to be putting more information out next week. Mailing in bills and online bill payment, uh, I think is really easy. You can go and pay any of your bills online. You can mail in a bill. It ends up being fairly quick and easy for us. We found that with the treasurer's door, or office door being shut, it's a way that um, you can still get all of those functions done. 
This came at both a good and a bad time for Norwood. We're in the process of converting a lot of our different software over and systems over. We're going to be doing online building permitting for a while. Um, hey, Dora, great to see you. Thank you for uh, for joining us. Um, so we're going to look at trying to expand those going forward because there's a lot of services we're finding we can do digitally. But really, it's not about the town. It's about uh, sort of the habits of the average member of the public. And folks who have come in and paid their electric bill for years at town hall or paid their tax bill in person, some people like that human interaction and we want to be able to continue to offer that. But uh, it's given us a chance to showcase what we can do digitally. One of the interesting things we've learned is we've kind of all learned to use mail again. And before it used to be, well, bring it in or email it. And, and you know, you're always looking around for a stamp book trying to find one. And now we're telling people, well, just mail it in and we'll take care of something. And we'll mail it back to you. So I think there's been a great uh, kudos to our postal workers, incidentally, who are also still working through all this. But this has been great for us to realize, you know what, there, there's a lot that can be done through the mail. And maybe it's not instantaneous, but it doesn't necessarily need to be instantaneous. Uh, I'll go to a couple other questions. Thanks, folks, for the comments. We appreciate it. And thank you, David. That's a good question. We're um, we're going to always continue to march towards more and more online services, but we do like that personal touch here in Norwood. Uh, what additional changes have been made in our senior health care facilities and nursing homes to ensure that vulnerable populations are being kept safe? Are there new protocols? Are they being universally applied to all homes and centers? So a couple of things about that. Nursing homes are regulated by the state. So we have us, uh, we have a couple of, uh, we have four nursing homes and two assisted living facilities and they're regulated by the state. So they're, they sort of report up to the state. We're in the loop with them. Uh, I know the state has deployed additional testing to the nursing homes. One of the num reasons you're seeing the numbers go up at nursing homes, not just in Norwood, but all over the Commonwealth is that the governor's had the National Guard doing testing in a lot of these facilities. Um, they're doing several facilities a day. And as a result, the test number testing positive is going to go up. The state's looking at different regulations and how they're managing nursing homes. That's all handled at the state level. What where we do, uh, what we do here is we do communicate regularly with the nursing homes and the assisted living facilities in the hospital. We've been sharing what PPE or personal protective equipment we have with the nursing homes, and that's fairly rare. Most towns take a completely hands-off approach. We've gotten face shields and N95 masks from our very limited supply and gowns, and we're sharing the information around with, uh, sharing the supplies around with all these facilities, making sure that we're doing as much as we can do to share resources and information. We were able to work early on to connect the hospital with the nursing homes to start some testing early there, where early on there was a challenge about can they send their patients to the hospital to be tested or not. And we were able to work out a system to get them kits and get their staff trained on their nursing homes. So we don't directly regulate the hospitals. We don't directly regulate the nursing homes, but we're taking that leading step in coordinating with them and working with them. And they've all been great to work with. Nursing homes are getting absolutely hammered by this, and it's unfortunate that uh, it happens. And, and but we're we're working as closely with them as we can within the context of we don't actually regulate them. A uh, couple of questions that we've gotten: where the big drop box is for bills, I couldn't find it and put it in the smaller box. The smaller boxes always work. The big drop box, if you see, it, town hall has two parking lots. There's sort of the small parking lot where the staff parks. And then there's a larger parking lot next to what we call the print shop building where some staff park, but since we move the light department to access road, there's not many there. That box is um, the big drop box, if you will. So you can drop your bill payments in there or any of the smaller boxes at town hall. You can always mail them in as well. So that big drop box is located, uh, Jackie, in the bigger lot behind town hall. I, it's in theory, it's a drive up box. Every time I've tried to drive up to it, I don't seem to be able to quite reach it, but we're working on that. Uh, but that's where the big box is. You can also make payments online as well. Uh, I believe the ACH fee is only 25 cents. I could be wrong on that. Uh, question about town meeting. So at this point, we're anticipating town meeting going forward in late June. What we're trying to do is narrow the warrant down to the absolute bare minimum business that we have to do to get people in and get people out because we're going to have to practice some kind of social distancing and we just don't want to have anything on the warrant that we can't wait to approve until uh, September or October. I go through these dates so often, I almost said at a nine or 10. So um, some towns are looking at whether town meeting could be done digitally or remotely. Um, that legislation is working its way through the legislature. We haven't really had a discussion on that and there, there's a lot of concern about how you make it happen. But what most towns are doing is saying, hey, we have to call town meeting. It's our form of government. If you got to get that many people in a room, do just the business you have to do to get through into the next fiscal year. And then 
you things up in the fall, and that shouldn't delay uh, any question, uh, any, any projects, or shouldn't unnecessarily or cause any financial issues. I uh, can't we do it virtually? Again, the, the legislature is working on a bill to possibly allow that. Uh, if they pass that bill, we may then, may then take a look at it. Might be tough to have 250 people um, if we got a full complement for town meeting all on one Zoom device or go to meetings with the town use. But if that legislation passed, we may be able to have a hybrid if we're allowed to, where we could have folks who are able to do it, let us know ahead of time, and they do it. And folks who um, weren't be able to, we may still need to have some people available. You could have an issue where somebody in theory doesn't have access to technology and they're told that as an elected official, they can't participate without having it and that could create an issue. But that bill hasn't been uh, passed through the legislature yet. Uh, a couple other uh, good questions. Uh, tax income is expected to take a big hit. What is being done to respond to next year's budget in particular to avoid another override for the upcoming year? So a couple of items related to that. Local governments, we tend to trend a year or two behind the state and federal governments in terms of a recessionary environment if you hit a permanent recession. The revenues that the town has that is um, subject to seeing a short-term loss will be meals and uh, meals tax and uh, rooms tax, and possibly uh, excise tax will take a short-term dip. But excise tax is based on vehicles sold, so at some point, if you're seeing a short-term dip in vehicles sold, it will go back up. The property tax, which makes up the overwhelming majority of our revenue, actually remains fairly stable even in recessionary times. Even in 2008 or 9, property tax collection rate goes down slightly, but the total tax levy doesn't actually decrease. So our revenues are going to be relatively stable for next year. Going into fiscal 21, we already only project 90% 90 year, 90 of the prior year's local receipts. So those are fees, fines, uh, meals tax. The other area that we're, so we're, we're pretty good there. The other area we could see a drop in is state aid. However, total local receipts and total state aid make up less than 20% of our revenues. Um, maybe it's uh, between 20 and 25%. So even if you took a devastating cut in both of those, you're still within a couple percentage points. The budget as presented to the finance going into next year has $1.1 million going into stabilization. So on the top of the budget, we're putting a million dollars into the bank for savings. So that's a good financial cushion. We're moving our capital purchases to the fall with the exception of a couple of uh, required items. So that way we have free cash, uh, which is available surplus revenue to cover emergency expenses and to cover any revenue shortfalls this year. And we'll have more of that available next year to plug any gaps as we look forward to an FY22 budget. If there's going to be an, a big impact on the budget. It would be more for FY22, but we'll know that September, October, when we're looking at um, a, um, uh, if neighboring towns are asking them to cut their budgets by 25%, they're asking them to cut their operating budgets by 25%, not their, their personnel budgets. 80% of our budget is personnel. So I could cut the office supply budget by 25% and you would never make it. If you know which towns those are, by all means, share it with me because they're looking at if they can cut it. But if it's their operating budget, that's really irrelevant. I mean, the school budget is 90% salary. So if they cut the other part, you're really not making much of a cut. So as we go forward, those two revenue items could see a drop. You make adjustments in the FY22 budget as you uh, as you move along, mainly because our main source of revenue stays relative, even in a recessionary environment. I'm going to back up and make sure we're getting uh, all these questions here. Uh, uh, going to be summer camps. Peter, uh, the short answer is we do not know. We would like to ramps we are looking at either a model where we run a camp at each uh, possibly at each elementary school site to reduce the total number of students uh, as well as whether we can get a camp up and running in just a couple of days once we get noticed but the short answer is we just don't know yet we have to wait for the state to give us guidance on that given that schools are closed through june the nece the um problem with schools being closed through June is parents are going to need something in the summer, especially if the economy starts to open back up. The short answer is we just don't know yet. We had a call um, on that just uh, this week with the rec department and trying to figure out how we make it happen. It's the same with pools. We're not sure if we're going to be able to open pools for the summer. We may be able to. Uh, it's probably 50-50. The challenge may come that by the time we know we're okay to do it, it takes time to be able to ramp up and get it done. We have to hire lifeguards. We have to know they're coming on. We have to do their training. We have to treat the pools. We have to get them ready. So if somebody says on July 15th, you can open a pool and they tell us on July 10th, by the time we're up and running, we're almost running at the end of that season. I really hope we can get summer camps up and running. It's only going to be if we're able to do it uh, with um, in a safe manner that the state is okay with and that people feel comfortable with. Uh, David had a question, are street paving projects still happening as planned? Yeah, we're Yes, we're going forward with all of our street paving projects. We had a little bit of a delay as we had to adjust to some changes. 
but most of our money for road paving, uh, about 900,000 out of the 1.6 million we spend comes from the state. Those are ongoing. About uh, the other $600,000, which is a uh, local approval, uh, we're still planning to move forward and that's planning to go forward in the budget as, uh, as proposed. We're gonna continue to do road work. You skip out on your infrastructure, it just catches up with you down the road and costs you more. Uh, you're welcome, Lisa. Uh, some information there for, I think Jackie had asked a question about um, another food donation drop off. The answer is yes, it was wildly successful. Uh, we're going to be doing another one. We're probably looking at it every other week. We'll be getting information out on that in the next couple of days. Uh, uh, Doris had asked a question uh, about, are we paying all the stipends for school extracurricular activities, et cetera, and teachers' lunch monitoring activities that are not happening? The answer is for right now, yes, because those are still contractually, uh, contractually obligated on the one hand. Even though they're not happening, it's not their fault they're not happening. Plus, the town, like most municipalities, is a direct pay for unemployment. So whenever we don't pay somebody, they're able to file for unemployment. And we have to pay 70% of the wage for that. So it's a unique contractual uh, obligation. A lot of those things are still happening. So a teacher may receive a stipend to be a department head. They're still being the department head of the stipend. I can tell you that teachers are not being compensated for the work they're doing outside the context of their contract, where they're now being told to teach from home a couple hours a week and do distance learning. That's certainly not something in their job description. And uh, they've had no problem doing it. And they've risen to the challenge uh, admirably. So, and not to mention that the town of Norwood, as long as we have funding available, we are committed to paying everyone their regular wages. We know that people are hurting and we don't wanna be a cause of uh, more pain if we're able to do it. If people are budgeted through the end of the year, we feel we owe it to our employees, the people who step up and serve the community to make sure that they're compensated uh, to the extent we can. We always, uh, I always like to say, we wanna be the kind of organization we wanna see in the community. So we're trying to do that as well. Now, if there was a long-term change next year to those activities, that might be different, but we're committed to keeping everyone paid and on benefits because all we do are receiving benefits. Otherwise, we're just trying to shift the burden around and we're not really helping anyone. And a lot of these people have really stepped up to the, uh, stepped up to the plate. There's a lot of work going on behind the scenes where people are doing a lot of work that they're not normally uh, supposed to do. We have uh, school bus drivers that are delivering meals to seniors. We have teachers and guidance counselors going in and uh, organizing fund, uh, food drives and raising funds. I mean, they're going above and beyond in a completely changed world. And uh, my, my job in a lot of ways, other than becoming more difficult, is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's just a different uh, shift. But teachers are among a lot of folks who have been asked to just fundamentally operate completely differently, just like that. Uh, one post said that some restaurants should be wearing anything. So the, the mask requirement... Ooh, uh, we're getting a little bit of trouble. Uh, and folks can let me know if they can still hear me because we're getting a little bit of um, trouble playing the video, but if you can still hear me, let me know. Uh, we're doing, uh, restaurants have to follow their normal food handling protocols and they're continuing to follow their food handling protocols, uh, which we uh, certainly enforce. The health department is making inspections on a regular basis and they're following up with them. Sometimes in a kitchen, there's a perception that wearing gloves is safer than not wearing gloves. But uh, as somebody who's a, in a prior role as a certified food manager, if you pick up food off the ground with a glove, it's no longer hand for the, okay, great. The, the audio is going fine, keep going. My video happened to cut out. So um, we're, we're enforcing that to the extent we can. There are some situations where you can't socially distance yourself and you can't necessarily wear a mask, and that's a challenge. We have a challenge with firefighters when they have their SCBA gear on, but they can't also wear a paper mask and they may have to take off their gear quickly to act uh, quickly. And as a result, if there's some cases where you're not gonna be able to say 100% of the time you must wear a mask uh, where you are. Most of the restaurants are working to comply with it, but sometimes you're gonna stand next to somebody and uh, there's a communication issue and there's a safety issue with a communication issue communicating through a mask. So we've asked them to be as compliant as they can, but the nature of some jobs are gonna make it impossible that you are in a small confined case wearing masks and gloves at the same time. That's an area where, remember that food service workers are already trained on food service and food safety protection. And if they follow those same protocols, everything should be fine. They already have protocols about what their hand washing is, uh, what the uh, materials are, and uh, how they handle themselves and not feeling well. Those have been standard in the food service industry for many years, so that'll help us out. Thank you everyone for letting me know that the audio is going well. Uh, Ali said, our street looks great. First time in 13 years. You're welcome. Uh, and thank you, Jay, uh, Jonathan. Our municipal employees are doing fantastic. They're doing incredible things. Uh, yeah, so as I said, some restaurants aren't necessarily wearing masks, and that's just the nature of the work makes it impossible for them to be able to do both at once. But they're following all their standard food safety protocols as well. 
Uh, let me just check if I got into the online questions. I believe I have. I've got a few more questions here from folks. Uh, a few people asked about additional changes to nursing, uh, senior health care facilities and nursing homes. Uh, again, that, as we said, is all related to uh, regulations by the state. And I'll take a quick break and remind everyone to call our call center at 781-352-2363-824 with any questions. And yeah, let's see if we have any other questions here. We did get a question about group homes, and these are uh, group homes for individuals who may have disabilities. They also are regularly, um, uh, they report to the Department of Public Health. So they work with them and they have access to the Department of Public Health to get PPE through DPH and MEMA, which is the state's emergency management agency. If any of those agencies are having trouble uh, getting their gear in their group home in Norwood, they can always reach out to us and we can work with them and see what we can share with them. We have had some communications with some of them about what their needs are. Group homes were actually ahead of the curve in a lot of ways and sort of closing their homes off to outsiders, which has been difficult for their family members. But, um, it's a, uh, we're, we're working to help them out as much as they can. They can always reach out to us if they do need supplies and we can try to see if we can find them supplies. It's not that we necessarily have them, but the special needs group homes are particularly uh, challenging environments, especially for their staff, but they do report directly to the Department of Public Health and the Mass uh, Emergency Management Agency. Uh, local DPH recommendation of family members of those who have tested positive. Is there a growing concern that family members could be working in food service without masks or symptoms? So if somebody has tested positive, they are quarantined by the local public health department. Their immediate family is usually asked to quarantine too if they live with them. So in theory, if somebody is a worker and they're a food service worker and they test positive, they're quarantined. And then we do that contact tracing and we quarantine anyone else who has to be quarantined as well. That could be individuals that they've come into contact with in the workplace. So if you have two people working in a very confined area for an extended period of time and one of them ends up testing positive, the contact tracing would relieve, uh, would, uh, would reveal who they need to talk to and we would confine those people as well. We're being generally very um, conservative on releasing people back. There is CDC guidance that a couple of days after uh, no symptoms you can go back with. I know with our staff we're being a little bit more cautious with that and we would recommend everyone else do as well. But in theory anyone who tests positive, if they test positive and we know they're Asked a corner. Now, for a small kitchen that has five or six people working in it and somebody testing positive and the contact tracing reveals that, you could unfortunately have a restaurant that may have to close because too many people were in too close a contact. Uh, the actual risk of the, the, the virus, uh, my understanding from the public health department, being transmitted to food is actually very minimal, uh, especially if it's food that hasn't been cooked, but it's not really a, a regular means of uh, it transmitting through food. It's the same thing with a lot of the surface contact. It's important to wash your hands constantly, but that's that person to person contact. The surface contact, you should clean regularly used surfaces frequently, but there's a much lower risk there than if I was sitting directly across from somebody and sort of talking to them and droplets are coming out. Uh, so food safety is generally, it's always a concern, but most kitchens have been ahead of the curve in terms of following their practices. If they follow their current practices for food safety, there should be no concern. Uh, comment from Julie, shout out to all the teachers and admins, emails from teachers at all hours of the day, and we really appreciate the extra time they're putting in. Absolutely, we do. Again, education has been completely upended in a very short manner of time, and uh, it's, it's a shout out to Dr. Thompson and all of his principals and all of the teachers who are doing that and all the paraprofessionals and the special ed assistants who are helping out as well, and as well as some of the back-end folks at the school department. The facilities department has been doing an incredible job. The um, cafeteria workers have been doing a uh, uh, great job, and as well as our IT staff, both on the town side and the school side. Uh, in particular, shout out Mark Redlick and Sean Warnock, who work for the town's IT department, and Sandy and Joe, and then Joe Kidd on the school side has been uh, fantastic. He's helped us out in a lot of areas as well, and I know he's he's doing everything from talking to people about an issue with a Chromebook to figuring out how to replace his service over the summer, so shout out to them. Uh, Kate asked a question, the Norwood record published names and addresses of people who owe interest in fee for non-payment of real estate taxes. Will these people be helped if they lost their job or given an extended due date? Why do they publish this information? That's a great question. Those are all tax bills that were previously due. So it's a standard practice in town. Uh, you have to publish the unpaid taxes because the town has to go through the tax taking process of taking a parcel if it's unpaid for taxes. So there's a required publishing there. Those are all folks who are uh, prior to this well behind on their taxes. 
So if your tax bill is due May 1st and you don't pay it on May 3rd, your name doesn't instantly go into a newspaper or anything like that. It's actually quite a lengthy process. So those are accounts that have been delinquent for quite a while. The tax taking, I believe, takes it's either one or two years before that can get published. So that is over a year um, that they have been overdue already. Uh, if they're having specific COVID uh, concerns, they can contact us. We're certainly willing to try to help them. But those are folks who are at least a year, if not two years, uh, behind on their taxes. Uh, they, and as I said, they publish the information because it's a required public um, uh, publishing. Uh, we have a lot of requirements for a lot of different items to be published in a local newspaper, uh, letting the folks know that that's what the town's doing. It's the standard tax taking process for uh, communities in Massachusetts. We certainly, our heart goes out to anyone who is having trouble paying their taxes. If anyone does ever have trouble, and including folks who haven't um, done it in a while, uh, who are quite behind, they can always contact the treasurer's office and look at repayment options and look at ways to help them out of that situation. What you find is sometimes there's an oversight. Uh, you have an estate that transfers and somebody hasn't been keeping, it up, uh, keeping up on it. Sometimes a business goes bankrupt. It's, it's increasingly rare that there's an individual just living in their homes who can't pay their taxes. Um, people, folks struggle to do that, but the town has never actually taken a home uh, or a property for an individual who's saying, I just have no money to be able to pay my taxes. Last 45 years, that's never happened. It's usually properties that get abandoned. They got left in uh, a will or they, there's a fight over them. It's usually a rare, uh, rare case, or sometimes people own little plots of land and they don't necessarily know about it. So that's where we see a majority of those uh, items. Most folks with a mortgage will have their escrow company pay them. But that, that's a good question. That timing of that posting was not related to COVID-19. It was simply a, um, a regularly scheduled posting that we do once a year because the year has gone up uh, or the two years has gone up for uh, regular tax process. I will take more questions if folks have them. Uh, here we go. Does the town have a plan to become directly involved in infection testing or antibody testing, not through the hospital? Uh, I'd love to. We don't really have the means to do that, per se. If something comes through the state or the federal government that we can help out in that or we can do something, we'd be more than thrilled, I think, to do that. It's not really within our, our resources or sort of our uh, purview, but if we had to offer a site or could somehow help or facilitate that happening, we'd certainly be more than willing to. I had mentioned earlier, we have um, there's a lot of sites out there, a lot of folks looking for places to do antibody testing or uh, anything else, we don't really, um, we would be willing to help that. In terms of the town doing the testing, it's generally not something that public health has done. And even, even some state and, and other officials weren't really aware that that's not usually what public health does. If there was a means for us to do that, I think we'd be looking at doing it. What you're going to need to see uh, happen would be the availability of testing. So there's testing there now. It's not widespread that anyone could get a test um, can uh, get a test. You, you need to be somewhere in the process, first responder, or have tested positive or quarantine. They need to have enough kits and the ability to either get the instant test or get them sent out. We'd certainly be willing to look at it once there's a means for us to be able to do it. It's one of those challenges where at what level do you scale something like that? So do you scale it up where you do it at the state level? Do you do it at a regional level? Is it best to give the tests locally and do it? I know with the contact tracing that's going on, probably have the resources doing it now unless the state, unless we moved all of our contact tracing to the state. Uh, would it be possible for the local DPH to expand on the numbers and provide ages, nursing homes, cases, and mortalities? How are we protecting? How, okay, so long question here. So we, we provide, the information that we get actually comes from the state. So when we, we use an online system that the state gives us the information. So I can tell you in general where our numbers trend, about 40% of our cases are nursing home cases. Uh, another significant portion are folks who are still required to uh, work. And then there's a very small percentage of folks where it's just really untraceable. Um, I did get a message from somebody, uh, just uh, to go back real quick to the point on um, infection testing or antibody testing, not through the hospital. When and if a vaccine becomes available, that would likely be done through local public health. So we would likely set up a way to do that. We do um, some flu vaccines every year for certain residents, but the likelihood that when a vaccine becomes ma uh, available in mass and it needs to be given out, that would actually likely be a local public health responsibility. Um, the mortality question in particular, again, we get all that information from the state and the mortality question in particular needs to come directly from the state for a couple of reasons. It's sort of complicated. If a Norwood resident Tra travels to Newton Wellesley Hospital or a, a hospital in Boston and they pass away, the local, we don't get until we get information from the state um, 
whether or not that person's passed away. It gets recorded in the town it happened in, and then it gets recorded where they buried. Eventually, that information comes to us through means sometimes a week or 10 or two weeks later. Same thing with Norwood Hospital. Somebody who lives in another community and comes to Norwood Hospital may be listed as deceased in Norwood, but they are a resident of Walpole or any other town. So the state vital statistics contain some of that information and we would need to get it from them because we don't have a means of really analyzing what a Norwood mortality is because is it somebody who traveled to Boston from Norwood, but a number, there may be a burial certificate issued for somebody from Walpole who just happened to come to Norwood Hospital. So the state vital statistics has those that information. The state also has the specific information about age groups and uh, what's at a nursing home. We Our system doesn't let us even really triage that information that well because it all comes from the state. It goes from them to us. I can tell you that in general, uh, from what I hear from the public health staff, our numbers are not indifferent than anyone else. They're trending older. Uh, they're trending to um, the, the mortalities that we're seeing are older individuals or folks with pre-existing health conditions. So there's nothing in our numbers that's really different than anyone else's numbers in terms of the mortality and other numbers. In terms of protecting NPD and NFD, police and fire all have um, N95 masks available. They've been able to arrange some of them. We have a supply. It's limited. We've been getting supplies through MEMA, which is the Mass Emergency Management Agency. Uh, Congressman Lynch's office has been fantastic in getting us uh, information uh, and helping us get resources as well. So shout out to Congressman Lynch, who actually called the town over the weekend. So your local congressman is taking time out of his day to call local officials and make sure that they're doing well and that we have everything we need. And uh, shout out to NPD and NFD who are doing their uh, their best under trying circumstances. A COVID case is a difficult case to respond to. Our numbers are sort of down in some areas, up in other areas, but kudos to both departments. They're doing great. And uh, as well as the dispatchers who are there and Chief Maurice and Chief Brooks are doing uh, fantastic as well. Uh, teachers, no record. All right, I got a couple other questions here. Um, and folks can continue to ask questions. Yeah, as I go through my group homes, PCAs, nurse homes. I think I may have run through just about all the emailed questions in, so I can definitely take any additional questions from uh, folks online if folks have any more questions. We can continue to going. I'll take a moment while I'm sure folks are digging out their questions to remind everyone. I don't know if the video feed has come back or not, but you can call the call center 781-352-2363-824. We will be expanding our hours in the next week, and we do have translation services available if English is not your first language and you want to contact the call center. We have the ability to get you in touch so that we can have a translator help you through. Call if you just need to talk to somebody. Call if you need help with anything. Call with any questions you have. It's the best means for us to get aid directly out to uh, individuals. I had received a question about closed captioning. We're at some point going to look at trying to do closed captioning. We haven't quite figured out how to make it work yet, but we'd like to be able to do it uh, as soon as we can. We're still sort of doing this in a, in a low-tech fashion, but we'd like to add closed, uh, closed captioning. We'd like to get these available for uh, NCM to show them on Norwood Community Media. We're still working with uh, some of that as well. We're going to have to pick a day where we tell everyone we're going to have 100 different Facebook Live tests so we can test different things, but you don't need to watch actually any of them because it would just be us on there uh, testing them. Uh, do we have other questions from the public? I think I've gotten most of the questions in chat, uh, but we're certainly here for more of them. Any more questions? So I will let everyone know, uh, one of the unique things that we're doing here in Norwood is we're doing a weekly family meal program through the Norwood uh, Public Schools through the Food Service Program. This is really unique to Norwood. Uh, so once a week, you can sign up and you can go get a family style meal. Uh, to try to help with the security. Uh, oh, Norwood Fund. Great question, Julie. So to help with food security. So uh, we did 250 meals last week and 330 meals this week. And it's been incredible. It's been a great program. If anyone out there uh, in Facebook land has used the meal program and has tried the meals, I'd be happy to know how they are. This is a locally developed, locally run and locally funded project that we want. We got up and running very quickly to try to address this severe food security issue that we're facing in the community. And uh, we'll actually have some very good news coming out of, uh, in May or June uh, coming out uh, very soon. I'll have a great update probably in the next hour or so. How the Norwood, Funny, Norwood Fund money is being used. So a big shout out to all the folks who have donated to the Norwood Fund. We're up to about $20,000 total. Uh, Diorio Engineering gave us a $10,000 donation. It was very, very generous. That money gets used for a couple of different things mainly direct assistance to, re to, rev to residents. There's no, there's no overhead with that money. There's no 
doesn't get spent on town supplies or anything like that. Uh, seniors, veterans, folks facing food insecurity and folks facing uh, utility issues. So as people have been calling us, when we have funds available, we can help utility bills. We can help with uh, direct food assistance in some cases. Seniors have some need for food assistance uh, and veterans as well. A lot of it's focused around food, but sometimes it's they may be okay with food, but they're getting behind on a bill and it's direct aid to residents. So none of that gets spent on town supplies or town salaries. Uh, we just posted a link there. It, it, any dollar that goes in there is a dollar that will go directly to a resident. And that's absolutely critical. And it's that immediate aid that we're able to provide in cases where benefits haven't caught up or they just have a unique problem that um, you can't necessarily get through one other food pro uh, program. So it's, uh, it's, it's making a huge difference. I mean, when somebody calls you and they tell you they're completely out of food, or that they're completely out of food and they don't know how they're gonna feed their kids over the weekend and you're able to immediately deliver some food to them, it's, um, you know, you're making a big deal in, um, in people's lives and that's critical. So again, that money doesn't get used for grant matches, doesn't get used for uh, anything else other than direct aid to individuals. So great, great question, Julie, I appreciate that. Um, the more the merrier, we've had a lot of generous donations, um, people bringing in a lot of money and we appreciate it. You can donate online, you can donate by mailing in a check. If uh, you have cash, we're not really taking cash, uh, but you can go to Norwood Bank or the Bank of Canton, get a check made out and then mail or drop that off to the town. But it's direct aid to residents. If for some reason it didn't get spent and uh, something tells me we could use a hundred times what we have in there, it would stay in those same accounts to help people when they're struggling to pay a heating bill or something else. And that, that's really one of the situations we'll face is somebody will say, well, gee, I, I've got food, but I'm out of work and I don't have any income coming in and I have a heating bill or I have an electric bill or, or a, a similar bill. And we're able to say, look, we can provide assistance for it. So if you need help, please, by all means, just let us know and um, call the call center. And we're reaching out to folks and triaging and helping them out. And it's, uh, it's made a big difference. And I'm grateful to everyone that's donated so far. And I'm grateful to everyone that um, continues to donate. And we'll have a really positive announcement um, coming out soon about uh, a big donation from a local institution that's going to make a huge difference in some of the school meal programs. Uh, some programs like that we may look to fund out of donations if we run out of money, elsewhere, but we're committed to feeding everyone. Uh, has the National Guard, uh, thank you uh, both Kelly and David for your comments, and again it's, it's we're, we're trying to get direct aid to people and that's really the goal. Has the National Guard been called in to assist in any nursing home outbreaks in Norwood? So early on, what happened with nursing home uh, outbreaks, if you will, the National Guard did respond to the old soldier's home in Holyoke. That's actually a state facility. So that's a little different than uh, they sort of responded to take over uh, a facility. That's actually a state-run facility. What the National Guard is doing at all the nursing homes in the state, they're visiting a few days, is they're assisting with testing. So they have been to, I believe, all of the nursing homes in Norwood. If they haven't yet, they've made their rounds through them where they're going in and they're basically doing testing on everyone. So it's a big help. It's a big help to the staff. So they're involved and they're um, they're doing a lot of, uh, they're doing testing in all the nursing homes in uh, throughout the country, uh, throughout the Commonwealth. And that's really because nursing homes don't normally do that. They can do it on a case-by-case -case basis, but we're, um, uh, they're assisting all the nursing homes in the state, and they have been in many of the nursing homes in uh, Norwood. I think they're, they're, the, the National Guard alone is testing several hundred people a day at a variety of different nursing homes. I, I had seen a number about how many they're visiting. I don't know, but they visited an overwhelming majority of uh, nursing homes in the community. And Cindy, we certainly appreciate doing this. If folks continue to like this, we're, we intend to continue to do our Facebook Lives every week and give folks a chance to answer questions, and we'll We'll answer them the best that we, uh, to the best of our ability. We think it's a great way to reach out to folks. We do want to see if we can enhance it and get some, um, make sure that the video continues to work and make sure that we can get some closed captioning and get these up on NCM. But we want to try to get the information we can out there. And you're right, it does seem to change every day. Uh, two days ago before the governor announced that schools were closing um, through the end of the year, I was having a conversation with somebody in education about how, hey, we think we know if we went back to school, you know, the 10th of June and we could do this and we could do that. And then the governor came out with his announcement and we said, well, it changes every day. So it's, it's a little challenging and frustrating to change with, uh, with so much change going on, but um, we're, we're slowly entering the new normal. The good, if there's any good in this, the, the state numbers may be plateauing. So that's, you know, they need to first plateau and then they'll start to slow to drop off. And after a certain period of time, once numbers drop off, that's when you can start to look at what restrictions you can begin to release in a very slow and controlled manner. Uh, thank you very much, uh, both Cindy and Matt. Uh, do we have other questions from folks? I 
I have several other meetings to get to tonight that I'd rather uh, not have to get to, so I'd rather stay here. Uh, I want to pay my electric bills, so where should I go to pay it? So there's a couple of options there. Um, if you're going to pay with a check, you can either mail it into Town Hall at 566 Washington Street. You can drop that check off in any of the, we have small boxes at all the doors to Town Hall, and there's a drop-off box in the large parking lot behind Town Hall. So Town Hall has two parking lots, uh, a small one and a big one. And uh, the big one is where we have a drop-off box as well. Now, if you normally pay cash for your bill uh, because you work in cash, you can go into the Bank of Canton main branch in Canton or the Norwood Bank branch here in Norwood, and they will issue you a check for your electric bill. You got to, uh, just for a town bill, but that way if you normally are used to dealing cash, if you're underbanked or unbanked, you can use that as well. If you go online to our website, there are ways to pay your bills online. Uh, I know my electric bill every month uh, automatically. And I always uh, always encourage everyone if you're able to to do that. I'm lucky that my bill is generally uh, relatively low, um, but if you're able to do that, I encourage it. So you can pay online, you can drop them off, uh, and you can if you have cash, you can go and get a check made out from Norwood Bank or the Bank of Canton if you have the cash. They will make a check out for your electric bill or your water bill or sewer bill or cable bill if you're with the town to the town in Norwood in that amount, and then you can bring that check in and drop it off in the boxes or drop it off in the big box. Uh, thank you very much, Julie. Other questions. Do we have families still need Chromebooks? If yes, do we know how many are printers required too? So my understanding from Dr. Thompson is they currently have more than enough uh, Chromebooks that they've been offering them to families. They've been contacting people and saying, do you need a device at home? And my understanding is that currently there's not a need for additional ones. They always have to go through a refresh of their stock. Uh, if schools were to not go back into session in September, you may need to see that need, but currently they don't think that that's a need and we would look to make sure we can get uh, Chromebooks if we have. Um, are printers required? I don't believe printers are required. I would have to defer to a teacher about whether they're making students print anything. I don't think so at this point. They're trying to do as much online um, learning as possible. Uh, a printer is probably not a bad idea, but I don't think they distribute printers with them. Uh, they're trying to do as much online as they can. And uh, the, uh, the town just posted the link there for different ways to pay bills. And we're going to be putting out some more messaging next week on how you can sign up for auto pay and direct pay and uh, pay bills online. And we'll continue to get that information out to everyone. And uh, I just got a, a very positive message, as I said, we'll be announcing a little bit later um, some positive uh, news about uh, a donation that will help our meal program. Uh, is there a large drop box by the Memorial Hall on Washington Street? Uh, there that's, that Dropbox is mainly for, uh, you can drop anything off in there. We prefer that payments go into one of the other bins or the bin in the parking lot only because that one was specifically put aside for bid packages and uh, plans for planning and conservation and ZBA. You can put one in there, but we prefer one of the smaller boxes or the main drop-off box, which is uh, out in the large lot behind uh, Town Hall. And uh, somebody just said printers are needed, so... Uh, Moved, where do I go for a change of address to vote still in Norwood? Contact the town clerk's office and they will arrange that with you. They're doing a little bit by mail and they'll do an in-person meeting with somebody if it's absolutely required to take care of essential business. So if you contact the clerk's office, uh, 762-1240 and then ask for the town clerk, they will work with you to get that uh, taken care of. But that's a great question. Uh, quick, quick note on the election. At this point, the election, uh, local election is scheduled for June 8th. We're working on a no-touch election, so there'll be PPE available, and there'll be uh, cleaning stations and sanitizer stations available, so we'll be able to make sure everyone is able to go in uh, safely and vote without really having any contact with anyone. It'll be, uh, at worst, it'll be no more than going to the grocery store, but at best, it should be um, a pretty well-controlled uh, function and absentee va ballots are available through the clerk's office as well and we always encourage that. Uh, we do get a lot of questions about allowing vote by mail. Uh, that's not something we're legally allowed to do at the local level. We can't make that decision on our own and I don't believe it's allowed at the state level yet either. I certainly think if vote by mail did become the law, it's probably not a uh, not a bad idea to look at it like that. We're just not able to do it at the um, local level. Uh, are there enough election work Workers will work the election. At this point, we uh, we think so. And if we did need more election workers, we would ask town staff who are working in certain areas to uh, backfill the election workers. Uh, we also could put a call out for more election workers, but we can take people who are already inter in uh, interacting with each other to uh, manage the polls. We also feel like given the number of absentee ballots and it's just a local election, we won't need to necessarily go uh, full force like we will need to in, in uh, November for the presidential election. 
Uh, it would be great if businesses could receive their utility bills electronically and accept payments that way. We are working on that. Once we actually convert through uh, our complete ERP software, we believe that's actually going to be an option available. We think it'll actually be available for your tax bills as well, where you can get that bill emailed. We have um, so many different software packages that we work with. It's our whole enterprise resource planning software is our accounting and our treasury and our collection software. And then we have separate billing software that it's integrating with at the light department. And then cable billing is actually a little bit unique for municipalities. So the goal is once everything is all done, all of that will be integrated and you'll be able to get a, um, you'll have email bill options just like you do with uh, some of the larger vendors out there where you can um, get that bill emailed to you. You can currently have your bill paid online uh, automatically through an automatic debit. The emailing of the bills, we can't wait to do because it'll actually save us money by not having to mail out a bill. I would much rather get my bill emailed to me. So that will come. Businesses can pay for their electric bill automatically monthly. We actually have one of our largest electric customers who's able to do that. Their, their electric bill is uh, north of $200,000 a month. And they're able to, uh, they every month, of course, they're a large company. They auto debit their account every month. We had to work with them on that to get it done. But um, that way they get their discount every month and they never miss a, a bill payment. But the the emailing of bills, tax bills, water, sewer, electric, that will come once our software conversion is completely up and running, probably sometime by the fall. The utility conversion was scheduled to take place uh, mid to late March. And obviously uh, our friend COVID-19 has delayed that a little bit, but we can't wait until we can get all that out there digitally. But you can sign up uh, online for regular payments. So great question. Uh, other questions? All right. We've gone a little bit over an hour. We're committed to doing this, as I've said, uh, every week uh, for an hour or two. And um, we'll continue to do it throughout this, uh, throughout COVID-19 until we're back to whatever the new normal is. So I'll just, uh, I'll start closing out. And as always, I'll stick around a minute if a few other folks have it. But I want to thank everyone for joining us today. The call center, 8 to 4, Monday through Friday, 781-352-2363. Thank you. And if anyone has any problems or questions or concerns, reach out to the town. You can always call town hall or if you need some kind of service or assistance or just to talk to somebody, call the call center. We are here to serve. Uh, new, uh, oh, provide the website. So Joe will provide the website. Uh, can I get a certified birth certificate by mail from the clerk's office? Uh, David, if you contact the clerk's office, just give them a ring and Mary Lou will walk you through that process because the registry has also changed some of their processes. So we, um, there's a way that we can find a way to make sure that that happens. Just give her a, um, give Mary Lou, the town clerk, a call in the clerk's office. We're more than happy to help you out and work you through that. And uh, we just posted the website there for paying bills online. And any, any problems you have with that, you can just email us at managers at norwoodma.gov or you can contact the treasurer's office directly. They'll be able to walk you through that process. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us. I'll stick around, but I hope everyone has a great day. Please stay safe out there. Please take care of your neighbors if you can and practice your physical distancing and be a good neighbor. And tough times are, are going on now and this will be tough for a while. And I know it stinks being stuck at home and um, there's a lot of folks who are suffering from being stuck at home, but we're going to get through this and we're on the other end of it by taking care of the community, which is what we've always done. And stay tuned in the next day or so, we're going to have a really good announcement about uh, the weekly school meal program and uh, a very generous donor who's helping us out with that. So thank you everyone and take care. Feel free to reach out to us if you need anything or if there's anything we can do for you. We're here to serve. Thank you. Oh, and somebody made a quick comment about the earlier time. Let us know what time works. We sort of picked four o'clock out of the blue and then we had to move it to two o'clock today so we can do really any time, whatever the consensus is. Thanks everyone. Thank you, David. You're welcome, Katie, David. So uh, for anyone still listening, somebody did send me a text message and ask if this is a real Burberry tie. This is a five ninety nine knockoff. Just if anyone's wondering. WB day up. All right, I'm going to go ahead and log off here for anyone who's still on. Um, if you have any questions, you can always email managers at norwoodma.gov. Thank you, everyone. Take care.